Now, Executive Suites with WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Welcome to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. Always glad to have you with us. Later on in the show, we're going to talk about we're going to talk with the head of Centerville Bank, a financial institution that's growing in Rhode Island, and kind of what's going on with finance now. But first, we take a left turn from that, and we are going to talk about the business of wine. I'm glad to be joined by now by Rob Russell. His family owns Westport Rivers Vineyard and Winery, and he is the general manager. Rob, thanks for being with us. Thanks, Ted. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. So, first of all, uh, some people might, I'm sure there are plenty of people watching who actually know Westport Rivers. They've had your wine. They've been to events there. But for people who aren't familiar, can you just give them a thumbnail sketch of, of what you do at Westport Rivers, how big the operation is? All right, yeah. We are a farm winery located in Westport, Massachusetts. The farm is 430 acres, of which uh, we've got about 80 acres planted to grapevines. And uh, we take the grapes that we grow and we vinify into wine. And there's different ways of uh, buying that wine or consuming that wine. You can come down and you can uh, have a glass of wine uh, at our farm, uh, attend one of our events. You can buy a bottle of wine, take it home with you. You could go to a package store or a liquor store and buy our wine there. Uh, or one of the many restaurants that were sold at as well. Yeah, and we have uh, some examples you brought with us uh, on the table here. We are not, I think, allowed to open them, unfortunately, while we're sitting here based on uh, the rules of Channel 12, but they're lovely to look at. Um, how much wine do you make in a year? And do you have a, do you have a best seller? Do you have a signature that is, you know, what you guys uh, think of as the default Westport Rivers wine? Well, our best seller uh, is our Farmer's Fizz, which is uh, currently a combination of Riesling and Chardonnay, and that's what you see right here in, in that can. Yep. Uh, it's been in a bottle before, it's, it's it. now it's canned, uh, as well as um, uh, the, the wine that um, will be kind of our flagship wine, though, is uh, Brut Cuvée, which is which is right here. There we go. Here, I'm going to hold it up so it gets on camera there. Um, so this is actually the one, uh, is this the one that was recently in the Wall Street Journal? It is. So I have to ask, you know, for a relatively small winery, uh, to be in a national publication, did you see a sales bump? Did you find more demand getting written up? The, fall, the phone is definitely ringing. People asking where can they buy our wines uh, more than usual, just people who haven't heard of it before. So yes. Coming to find you guys. So um, your family, as I said, owns Westport Rivers. Um, and I'm curious, talk about how it got started. Whose idea was it like, let's put a vineyard in Westport. Where did it come from and, and when did it happen? Well, the, actually the farm was bought by my, my parents in 1982. Uh, but they got the idea really from my great grandfather and grandfather. Um, my mom's grandfather had a winery in Hammondsport, New York. It was called Germania Winery that he ran and uh, my grandfather worked for him. It wound up getting sold uh, off during Prohibition. But they would heard stories about this uh, uh, endeavor and uh, my mom bought my dad the what's become now the infamous home winemaking kit. And in 1970 he started making wine at home. He'd always been a beer drinker. Now he started making wine and drinking wine and uh, wound up planting some grapevines in Dighton which is where I grew up. and. Uh, found out that he couldn't grow the types of grapes that he wanted to grow there. Uh, this is a second career for him. When he got to that point in his first career where he was able to exit that, uh, he had a small business in Providence called uh, Technical Materials Incorporated that he had start in the, started in the late 60s. Uh, when that grew, uh, they moved to Lincoln and um, he sold that in 1981. And at that time he'd done enough re research, uh, he had looked far and wide, um, you know, looked at upstate New York, looked at Virginia, uh, Ontario, the West Coast, uh, different wine growing regions and decided he wanted to stay here. There were a few other people in this area who were growing grapes and uh, he felt that he could make a run of it here. And um, he bought a farm in Westport, Mass. And uh, w what makes Westport special uh, is that it's, uh, well, as a town, uh, it's a small town farming community. It's changed a lot over the years. Yeah. But uh, back in the 80s, there was still uh, over 35 dairy farms in town, and he wanted to be part of a farming community. But uh, what was the difference between Dighton and, and Westport is it's on the coast. And so we have a maritime influenced climate. That's mm -hmm. the biggest challenge to growing European cultivars here is the, the cold of the wintertime. Yeah, and, and that so was one of, one of the questions I wanted to ask you is, you know, when people think of wine, where you get wine from, they think of, uh, they think of France, they think of Italy, they think of Northern California, not necessarily Southern New England. Yeah, what, what, what grows well here and what are the challenges of growing here versus one of those places? Well, we, on a worldwide scale, we're considered a cool climate and uh, we don't have enough heat in our climate to ripen up 
red Bordeaux varieties like Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, Zinfandel, uh, well it's not really Bordeaux, but uh, Merlot, uh, Malbec, Petit, uh, Petit Verdot here. It's more, would be considered more of a white wine growing region or even more specifically a, a uh, champagne growing mm -hmm. region or a sparkling wine growing region. And that's what we can do year in and year out best and that's kind of what we put our stamp on are the sparkling wines. Um, and that's a good deal of our portfolio, are uh, the Method Champenois sparkling wines, uh, as well as the, the other type, like the Farmer's Fizz here, yep. which is just a carbonated wine. But um, those, those are what grow best. So we, the varieties that we're growing are Chardonnay, uh, Pinot Noir, Riesling. Those are the ones that people will be most familiar with. But there's some more esoteric Euro European varieties that we grow, things like Arcazzatelli, which is from uh, Soviet Georgia. Uh, Gruner Veltliner, which is from Austria, Pinot Meunier, which is the third grape grown in Champagne, it's a red grape, um, Pinot Gris, people have heard of that one. Um, uh, you don't have to list them all, don't worry, it's no. not a quiz, <laughs> but that's quite a few, uh, that's quite a few alternatives. All right, we're going to take a break, when we come back, we're going to talk more with Rob Russell about Westport Rivers and their events business, and now they've also become a, a place to see and be seen. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. Glad to have you with us. Later on the show, we're going to talk to the head of Centerville Bank about their expansion uh, as they hit nearly their 200th anniversary. But right now, glad to continue the conversation with Rob Russell. He's the general manager of Westport Rivers Vineyard and Winery in Westport, Massachusetts. His family has owned it since they found it, I think you said 1982, mm -hmm. right? So you guys are coming to come up on an anniversary too next year, 40, uh, in a couple of years, 40 yep. years. So will you walk us through, Rob, the process for you guys and also the duration from like the planting to I'm um, opening one of these nice bottles and pouring a glass of wine. What are the steps and how long does it take? It takes a long time. It, it takes <laughs> years. So we do our own uh, propagation. We what does that mean? So to keep it short, yep. uh, we graft our own grapevines okay. and there's a, a multitude of reasons why to do this but we take a piece of rootstock and graft one bud, a cyan bud, onto the top of that and uh, we then callus it, the two stick together. We, we take that, grow that in a nursery for a year, dig it back up again, then we put it out in the vineyard. Um, so it, it takes a, a one year to create that vine to plant, and then it takes three more years once it's replanted in the vineyard. So it's a four year uh, process, process yeah. before uh, we have fruit, and then we, we pick that fruit, and then we vinify it. It doesn't take long to make wine. It takes one to three weeks to make wine, but then it gets aged, and depending upon the style of wine, it gets staged anywhere from a period of months, which we don't do much like that, but in general, the white wines age for a year, either in stainless tanks or in oak barrels. And then <coughs> um, uh, sparkling wines can get aged for anywhere up to 15 to 20 years. So it just takes, it, it just, it takes a long time. And if somebody says, hey, why don't you do this? Right. It's a little bit different than a brewery where, you know, <laughs> you, uh, many times most of the breweries around here, they buy their ingredients, it's water, hops, and, and barley usually. And so it's, you can buy some different stuff, put it together, go through the cooking process, the fermentation process, and voila, three weeks later, you've got a new product. It takes us years. And uh, so um, a lot of thought goes into. So the year, Rob, the year on the bottle, when you buy a bottle of wine, which part of the process happened in that year? That is the year we picked the grapes. That's the year you picked the grapes. Mm -hmm. so, we're, so the process started for some of the wines on this table then many years ago, right? Yeah, well that uh, the yellow label wine was 2000 and Nine, I believe. Yeah, and that's when you picked the grapes. So you right. were starting the process even before that as you got things going, right? Well, the, the, the vines were, yeah. were planted in the 80s <laughs> that, 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 you know, that grew the grapes that uh, became that wine. That's, it's, a, it's a long, how long was it from 1982 to when you guys first had wine to sell? Well, our first year that we planted grapevines was actually 1986. Gotcha. And after that, uh, we uh, planted grapes. We grew, uh, our first year that we had a vintage was 1989. Mm-hmm. We made a Chardonnay and a Riesling that year. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things uh, when I said I was having Westport Rivers on, people who are fans of your company said to me was they said, you got to ask them about their events business and memberships and how much uh, you've kind of, it seems like, created a community around Westport Rivers, along with, of course, just making good wine that people like to drink, but also making it a place people come to and have a connection with. Can you talk a little about well, how that fits into your plan? Yeah, to stay in business, you've got to sell the wine. Right. You can't just make it. And uh, to sell it, we've learned that by having a multitude of different channels, we're better balanced as a business. And uh, so one of our channels is to invite people to the farm. And 
in Massachusetts, uh, we have there, there's a permission granted by the state which allows us to sell wine by the glass. And so uh, we have the Sunset Music Series on Fridays and Saturdays, some Saturdays in the summertime, where we'll have uh, one or two people play music. Um, we'll have uh, beer and wine for sale. And um, we'll have a food truck or two, a raw bar. And we've got a, a giant lawn. Everybody goes out there, and it's a real. It's fit. a beautiful spot. It's I mean, I've seen. I've. I haven't been there myself, but I've seen photos people posted when they're yeah, there, and it's. It's really nice. Truly get to see the sun go down. Yeah. And, and it's a large expanse, almost like a valley, uh, going down to the Westport River where we are, and. Um, so people come out for that, and uh, it's a real family-friendly uh, time. It's only a couple of hours and uh, other events that we do. You just missed our open house. We have an annual open house this Saturday after Thanksgiving, yep. uh, which is a, a real big day for us, getting clean, you know, getting the whole place manicured and cleaned up right. and have a, a, a big day then. Uh, we also uh, invite people down just, uh, we're open five, six days a week, Monday through Saturday, 11, 11 to five. Uh, we have a wine club, which has grown uh, remarkably over the past uh, eight years or so. We've got a, between 2,000 and 2,200 members now. Uh, in so you kind of have to be everywhere. That's the business plan. You know, make good wine and then find a million different ways to get it to people. Sure. We also, you know, we're, you can find us in, like I said before, restaurants, yeah. uh, liquor stores. Uh, when we get to them, we can, we, the law allows us to sell direct to them. We also have a distributor in Mass. We have a distributor in Rhode Island. So just kind of get it out there through different ways. We're on, you know, we can buy our wine on the Internet. Yep. So, uh, so everywhere you can find it. All right. Well, Rob, that's all the time we have. Next time you're having a party, uh, try some Westport Rivers. Maybe next time you have a celebration, you can open some sparkling or something. But don't go away. When we come back, we're going to talk with the head of Centerville Bank about why they're expanding and what exactly is a mutual bank. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. Thanks for sticking with us. Right now, I'm glad to be joined by Hal Horvat. He is the chairman, president, and CEO of Centerville Bank. Perhaps you are a Centerville Bank depositor or customer watching at home. This is the man who runs your bank and keeps your money safe. Hal, thanks for being here. Thank you, Ted. Good to be here. So, um, first of all, uh, there will be people, of course, watching who don't currently bank with Centerville Bank. Can you just give I us... I can't believe it. I know, and, and, but when the show's over, I'm sure they'll all be yes, switching. Yes. That's your job today. So uh, just can you give us the basics 101 for people who aren't familiar with Centerville? Well, we're kind of a hidden gem in the state of Rhode Island. If you're not from the Patuxent Valley, you may not know about Centerville Bank, but we've been around for 191 years. So we, we were formed in 1828, and we're a community bank, mutual bank, uh, which means we're owned by our depositors, not stockholders. And we're, a, we're a very much a community bank that offers basic banking services, and we're very proud of our heritage in the Patuxent Valley. And I was looking it up uh, on the history page. Centerville, this it was a village in West Warwick um, where there was a lot of industrial activity back in, the, I guess this would be the early 1800s. Yes, and that's that was before my time, Ted. <laughs> but, uh, but really, the villages, I, I think, have... Uh, uh, lessened in, in, in West Warwick. We're actually located on Main Street. Yeah, people might be familiar the, with the building. Yeah. And the section of Arctic, it's called. So we, we, we go to Arctic every day. So we're taping this the end, near the end of 2019, and you recently announced you're acquiring another bank, Putnam Bank, which is over in Connecticut. Uh, what's the thinking behind the transaction? Why did this make sense for you? Well, we're very excited about it. Putnam Bank has a lo uh, an awful lot of similarities between Centerville and Putnam in terms of the business that they perform and also the culture. They're a community bank. They've been around for over 100 years. And we saw an awful lot of similarities, and it, and it gives us, as a community bank, an opportunity to grow a little quicker. Our goal is to be a top-performing community bank in southern New England, and this really kind of jump-starts us. It brings us into the Connecticut marketplace as well. It is another state, but it's very close to the border of Rhode Island. If you, if you match up our two branch structures in Connecticut and, and uh, Rhode Island, you can see that they're, they're very close. Sort of one of those fit-like-a-glove transactions uh, exactly. we see sometimes. I found it fascinating. Coincidentally, you used to work at Mansfield Bank. Just this week, they announced they're merging with Bridgewater Savings. That's um, right. So you see a merger at your old bank. You're currently running uh, an acquisition at your bank you run now. What, is, what do you think is driving that? Is there a, are there trends that are leading banks to think about the yes. need to, to, yes. to consolidate? You've seen acquisitions kind of heat up over the last few years, and I think they're going to continue to heat up over the next few years. It becomes more difficult for community banks, and, and the banking environment has changed dramatically with the advent of technology and smartphones, and, and it's, it's happening at such a rapid pace. It's important for banks to get to a, to a large enough size that they can compete against the, uh, the large behemoths that you might see on a national basis. So it gives you a little bit of an economy of scale 
and allows you to have a, b a bigger breadth of uh, geography. Because I've had, yeah, I've had the leaders of our community banks on a number of different ones over the years, and often, you know, it sounds like depositors they want the same, uh, you know, mobile banking experience and stuff that they can get from one of the huge national, you know, Wall Street banks. Uh, but that can be a bigger lift, it seems like, for a, for a medium correct. or smaller bank That's to correct. have the investment technology. I think the key for community banks like Centerville is that we need to match or or marry the the technology with the personal aspect. I think folks that we've seen in our research, re really the personal touch is very important, but you also have to have the technology to back it up. One of the things that community banks can do is develop partnerships with technology partners, third parties, that, that are much larger organizations than that have the, the R&D to develop some of the products. We can team up with those and make uh, technology the same way as a, as a larger institution. Rather than you try to hire 50 software exactly. engineers of your own exactly. for Pretty center. expensive to do Yeah, that. I would imagine so. Um, and you mentioned that, that personal touch, and I, uh, regular viewers will know I always end up asking this question when I have a banker on, but I'm just fascinated by the continued power of brick and mortar banking. I know it's changing, but you, you never hear any banker come on and say, we're gonna shut down most of the branches, people don't need it, we've got phones now. Um, and Centerville, I was looking, you guys have invested, you've renovated some of your branches, you've bought these things called ITMs, interactive teller machines. Clearly you think there's still plenty of demand for branch services and you, you think there will be going forward despite all the tech. Yes, despite all the tech, I think when, when it comes down to it, people still want to talk to an individual. And particularly when you're talking about finances, important uh, decisions like buying a business or buying a house or, or maybe going into retirement, those are the times that you really, I think, need to talk to somebody and, and somebody who's an expert in that business. So we've been trying to spend as much time in training our personnel and also making sure that we have that personal touch. So you mentioned ITMs, and one of the things about ITMs, it's just the next generation of ATMs. So everybody's familiar with it, what ATMs are. ITMs are just um, interactive teller machines. So it allows you to go up to a, an ITM. You can perform the same functions that you would at an ATM, but it also allows you to just push a button and you can talk to a person. And a face comes up from our call center. In like a hu an actual human? An actual Not human. Not a robot? Actual human. And you get to conduct any transaction. Oh, that we're you looking would. right now, as you say. Yeah, this is an example, I guess, of one we saw. Yeah. Yeah, so the person you're seeing, we have some great people in our contact center in West Warwick, and they're able to interact with you. You can ask them any questions, and you can really conduct any transaction that you would at a normal teller line. That's fascinating. I think, uh, you, do you find people, uh, are, are, they, are they using it or are they kind of not sure what to make of the, the person and the thing if there's a teller they can just talk to over there? Well, with anything new, <laughs> at first it becomes a little uh, intimidating, but once, what I've found is once you start to use it, maybe once or twice, then, you, then the usage goes up and, yeah, up and up. Yeah, I guess like anything else, right? Even I can use it. it well, that's, and that's impressive as yes. a bank president. So um, notable to me, and I'm going to ask people to, to stay on board because my, my business reporter side will come out here a little, but it was fascinating to me when I looked up the, the basics on you guys, you have one of the highest capital to asset ratios in the country. Now, I know for a lot of people, I'm capital asset ratio, what does that mean exactly? Put that in, why has that been, clearly that's been important to the bank if it's so high. Why does it matter? Why, how, what should people don't make of that? Well, it's critical. We actually are one of the highest capitalized banks in the country. And really what capital is, is it's, it's just that nest egg that you have that, that's able, you're able to invest that money over the long term into new products, into people, into new areas. So that has given us the, the capital or the money to really invest in some of the things that we've embarked on doing over the last five or so years. So. Now I could see the reverse where someone might say, well actually Hal, you're, you're sitting on too much, uh, you've saved too much, you should, be, you should be lending more out, get the leverage up, maybe make more well, profit. that's an excellent point and that's really one of the reasons that we've gone on an expansion plan over the last five years. It started about five years ago under my predecessor, Tom Lamb, who was the CEO who retired recently this year, and it's continued on over the next five years. We really plan to put that money as a community bank to invest it in the community, in loans, in deposits, et cetera. We have a plan in addition to Putnam Bank, uh, we also have a plan to expand throughout Rhode Island. Right now we have branches scheduled for Warwick and Cranston, over t 2020. We also have a Providence office scheduled uh, in the first quarter of next year as well. I see a lot. I won't, uh, I won't embarrass you by dropping other banker banks' names on television with you here, but I will say we see a lot of banks trying to expand right now, I feel like, uh, different, uh, who have maybe a regional base and are coming to places, and some of the big nationals trying to come into Rhode Island too. I mean, how, you know, not to give away your secrets, but what, do you, what is going to be your case to people when they see like, wow, there's so many different banks in my town all of a sudden to, to switch? 
Yeah, I mean, competition is fierce in the state of Rhode Island, and the population is really not growing. So, and as you mentioned, there are Massachusetts banks coming in here and, and bigger national banks. But what we think is our, our personal touch, personal, flexible, and simple. Those are the three tenants that we're trying to focus on. So personal, face-to-face, -face, or through an ITM. Uh, flexible, being able to provide different types of products, not one size fits all. And then simple, I think banking, People want banking to be simple. They don't want that to complicate their life, and we're trying as best as we can to really focus on those three aspects. And I suppose trust, too, after what we went through a decade ago uh, <laughs> with well, our banking system. Well, trust is critical. As, as you look at what happened in the banking system in 2008, um, community banks were not part of that, and that's important to note. And we've continued to do what we've always been doing, and trust is a critical piece of that. So, yeah, go ahead. I was going to mention, as part of our community uh, activity, is that we're very proud of the fact that we have a charitable foundation. And through our charitable foundation and through uh, the bank, this year in 2019, we'll invest about a million dollars in various different nonprofit agencies and everything from Little Leagues to uh, Meals on Wheels to Friends Way and, and a number of organizations that we're really proud of being able to invest. A million dollars is a lot of money, and we think it's, uh, it, it makes a difference in those organizations. Hal, also I want to ask you, you know, I always like when I have a banker on, uh, you talk to your your retail customers, you talk to businesses, you talk to all sorts of people. You kind of sometimes have a sense where the economy is going. So we look ahead to 2020, how are you feeling about the regional economy? What are you hearing from clients at Centerville? Cautiously optimistic, I think, and that's the way I've felt for probably the last eight or nine years. We've been on a pretty good run. And I think what's positive is the fact that it's been a steady growth rather than some boom that's ready to bust. And, and that's important. And from a banking perspective, we've stuck with the fundamentals. We continue to lend the way we always have lend with, those fun lent to, uh, with all those fundamentals. And I think that's important so that if we do have a downturn, we don't think it's going to be as, as critical or, or as, as, as steep as it was in the past. Well, again, with that capital asset ratio, you've got a, 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 sure. a safety margin if sure. there's a downturn. Tell me uh, briefly, we only have about a minute left. You, you touched on it earlier, but a lot of different ways to structure a bank. You are a mutual bank. As you said, that means your depositors own the bank, right, right. as opposed to shareholders uh, in the stock market. Uh, what You've been in different kinds of situations. What 30 seconds, what do you think the benefits are to that? The benefits are we can make long-term decisions. We're not worried about Wall Street and stockholders on a quarterly basis. And that's, that's the reason why we're doing the Putnam acquisition, the reason why we're expanding throughout Rhode Island, is we can take a long-term view of things uh, rather than worry about the month-to-month -month or day-to-day -day profitability and then really invest. All right, Centerville Bank Chairman, President, CEO Hal Horvat, thank you for joining me. You'll thank be you. seeing more of their signs. Sounds like in an increasing number of Rhode Island towns, so now you'll know uh, the scoop about what you're seeing there. Thank you. If you missed any of this episode, in the first half we had uh, the general manager of Westport Rivers talking about their winery and their vineyard and all the events they have down there. If you missed that, you can catch it on WPRI.com, and you can also subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. We'll see you back here next week on Executive Suite.